This is Jennifer Gonzalez welcoming you to episode 195 of the Cult of Pedagogy podcast. In this episode, we'll be exploring five fantastic ideas for collaboration projects you can use with your students this school year. Collaboration has been a prominent topic in education for a long time. Those who recognize its importance regularly point out that working together to solve problems and create new things is a vital part of life, so it makes sense to practice it in school. Ideally, we'll have students work together frequently because the skills needed to make collaboration work well take a lot of practice. One challenge teachers face in creating these opportunities is thinking up ideas for good projects. So I sent out a tweet asking for teacher-tested projects that went well and got students actually collaborating, not just dividing up the work. From those responses, I chose five examples, and I'm presenting them here as broader project concepts. The goal is to give you five different options that you can customize for your content area. For each one, I've also offered a quick description of the technology the teachers in the examples use to facilitate their work. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Coder Z for sponsoring this episode. Coder Z is a gamified coding platform combining STEM, computer science, and critical life skills. With a standards-aligned, award-winning curriculum, Coder Z eliminates fear through meaningful support and preparation of educators by implementing fun, flexible, and engaging instruction in a real-world context. Through the power of virtual robotics, students in fourth grade and beyond use computational thinking to overcome obstacles, show off their skills on a global scale, and embrace failures as a part of learning. With Coder Z, educators open pathways for students inspired and motivated to discover their future. Built for everyone from the tech nerd to the computer shy, visit cultofpedagogy.com slash Coder Z to bring coding to your classroom today. Support also comes from Hapara, a suite of instructional management tools for K-12 that is like nothing else. Hapara is the only tool on the market that provides ethical monitoring features, allowing educators to give students timely, formative feedback with a reason for closing a tab. What is ethical monitoring? It's a way to provide visibility into what your students are doing when they're learning online and to help them stay on track without constantly closing browser tabs or punishing them. Ethical monitoring leads to good digital citizenship in students, which is why you need a monitoring tool with features that allow you to foster positive relationships with learners, not adversarial ones. No other product in the EdTech space has a feature that enables educators to give reasons for closing tabs. They simply close browser tabs for students and in turn close off the possibility for them to learn how to exercise their executive functioning skills and make good decisions online. Hapara helps educators build relationships with students while giving them autonomy over their education. Visit hapara.com, that's H-A-P-A-R-A dot com slash cult of pedagogy to learn more about supporting digital citizenship skill building for students through ethical monitoring. So before I start sharing these five ideas, I've got two caveats and a challenge. So First, the caveats. The first one is that these projects are not strictly designed for collaboration. Any of them could be done as independent projects, but they happen to lend themselves really well to groups because each one naturally would be improved with contributions from more than one person. The other caveat is that if you're listening and thinking, aren't these basically the same things as project-based learning? The answer is yes, kind of. There's a lot of overlap between inquiry learning, project-based learning, problem-based learning, and other structures that go beyond having students simply regurgitate content. Whether they fit a precise definition of PBL is up for debate. For the purposes of this collection, I'm less concerned about whether something fits a particular label and more concerned about providing ideas that can get your students collaborating authentically. And then here is the challenge. And the challenge is about adding criticality and agency to your projects. All of the ideas I'm going to share could be executed in a very straightforward way, where students simply put together information and present it in some final deliverable. But I want to challenge you to go further with them by adding layers of criticality and agency. 
So let's define those terms. First, criticality. In her book, Cultivating Genius, an Equity Framework for Culturally and Historically Responsive Literacy, Goldie Muhammad, who appeared on our podcast in 2020, and that was episode 151, defines criticality as, quote, the capacity to read, write, and think in ways of understanding power, privilege, social justice, and oppression, particularly for populations who have been historically marginalized in the world. When youth have criticality, they are able to see, name, and interrogate the world to not only make sense of injustice, but also to work towards social transformation. Criticality is one of four key components of Muhammad's model for teaching and learning that helps all students, especially those in the margins, develop both personally and academically. If you design your collaborative tasks so that students are challenged to do this kind of thinking, the project will be elevated into something that is not only more meaningful for students, but also has the potential to dismantle the inequities so many teachers want to fight. Then there's agency, which is the idea that people have the capacity to take action, craft and carry out plans, and make informed decisions based on a growing base of knowledge. In other words, helping students learn how they can take action to improve their own lives and the lives of others. Student agency is a key priority in the street data approach, which we explored in episode 178 with authors Shane Safir and Jamila Dugan. The author's incredible framework for school transformation is grounded in a pedagogy that gives students the tools to become agents of their own learning and ultimately agents in the world. Adding opportunities for students to practice agency in your collaborative projects is another way for you to teach not just academic facts and skills, but what students can do with those facts and skills in their real lives. So the examples I'm going to share here may or may not contain equal amounts of criticality and agency. They were not submitted to me with those ideas in mind. I am adding this challenge, not as a commentary on the examples, but rather a nudge to get you thinking along those lines for your own projects. Okay, so let's get started with the ideas. Idea number one is a guide. Students create a guide that helps someone navigate a situation, an environment, or a process. Putting this guide together requires students to decide exactly what information to include, what to leave out, how much detail to offer. Students could create a guide to getting started in a particular hobby, a guide to completing a process or task, a guide to succeeding in a school, class, or other defined space. Here's an example, and when I say here's an example, I'm talking about the stuff that was submitted on Twitter. Barry Frank, a master teacher in Flushing, Queens, New York, had his 12th grade humanities students create a voter's guide for an upcoming local election. Students researched local politicians who were up for election, who they were running against, and their platforms. As journalists, the project summary says, students are responsible for gathering, evaluating, and verifying information along the way. And for all of these examples over on the website, I've got links to um, online documentation. Sometimes it's the teacher's uh, assignment. Sometimes it's examples of student work. And so there's lots and lots and links of this. So if you go over to Cult of Pedagogy and click podcast and then find episode 195, you will go to all of these different examples and there will be links out so that you can actually look at the materials for them. So the technology used in this particular example, Frank students used Spindle as their co-learning space where students posted work at various checkpoints to the class feed. Uh, Mr. Frank says that they engaged in peer critique, iteration, and work through problems through the platform. They also used Spindle for project management, uh, kind of like a Kanban, Mr. Frank says. And a Kanban is a system for organizing workflows. It originates from Japan, but it's used a lot in software development. Uh, this is what else Barry Frank says. Instead of their work living in Google Drive silos, Spindle offered a public collaboration space to work through the project. They also use the self-report feature to self-assess and reflect on their learning. So that's Spindle, S-P-I-N-N-D-L-E. So for this first idea, the guide, let's talk about ways that you can add criticality and agency to your project. And by the way, 
the projects that are listed here as examples do have some of this in them, but I'm just thinking beyond um, what our examples have. So for this idea, you could have students develop a guide that offers information to an underserved group in your community or your region or anywhere in the world, and then take steps to publish and distribute that guide. The guide can help that group meet a specific need or help them grow in ways that might be more challenging for this group than for other groups. A guide like this also should be put together only after interviewing and getting the input of members of the group to determine what kind of help they might need or aspirations they might want to fulfill. On the flip side, a different kind of guide could be written to teach those in power how to support the identified group more effectively. So idea number two is a local research project. In this one, students would research something about the history, the science, the government, or some other aspect of their local community with in-person visits and interviews as a key component of their research. Topics could include things like drinking water quality, specific court cases, the impact of certain industries arriving in or leaving an area, how certain landmarks got their names, flora and fauna native to the area, or the history of immigration to the region. So an example of this is called Listening to the Buddhists in Our Backyard. Under the supervision of their teacher, Andy Husio, and visiting teacher author, Chen Zing Han, six high school students at Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, spent 10 weeks immersed in the study of Buddhism in their local communities. Within 15 miles of their town, there are 11 Buddhist temples, Cambodian, Lao, Thai, Vietnamese, and Chinese. Students visited these temples, used thinking routines from Harvard's Project Zero, and learned to ask questions and do research in this immersive environment. After a week of these temple visits, students spent the remainder of their term researching themes that had emerged in their visits. The culture of mutual generosity between monastics and laypeople, cultural preservation and transmission in Asian American temple communities, and youth education. We sought to map and better understand the tremendous diversity of Buddhism in America today, Huzio explained, and to turn our attention toward often overlooked Asian American communities as opposed to a more typical focus on white convert communities in mainstream depictions of Buddhism. The team's work is documented on a beautiful website that I recommend you go and look at. It's just called listentolocalbuddhists.org and you can see all of the work that this team has done. For technology, this is what uh, Andy Husio says. The students used Slack for daily check-ins with each other and as a way to communicate during the day and over the duration of the project. Task management, delegation, and organizational matters were handled on Slack, which we used instead of an LMS. The students also used Google Docs, slides, etc. collaboratively, both in the research and writing process and when they were planning their final presentation. The final presentation was a public demonstration of learning over Zoom to 70 high school teachers, academics, a number of whom wrote books and articles that the team had consulted over the term, members of Phillips' alumni community, and others' interest in Buddhist education. So for a project like this, where you're doing local research, adding criticality and agency could look like this. If students embark on their research with the goal of helping a marginalized group by investigating a problem that needs solving, helping disconnected communities better understand one another, honoring a local person whose contributions may have been overlooked, or gathering opinions on a local issue, their project will prompt them to consider the people, places, and institutions of their daily lives through a more critical and hopefully more participatory lens. If they publish their research in a way that reaches and even impacts their community, even in small ways, the experience will build agency by teaching students how much influence a person can have through this kind of work. Okay, idea number three is a tour. Students create and present an in-person, video-based, or virtual tour of a place. The term place can be broadly defined to include physical spaces near or far, virtual spaces, or even imaginary spaces, and can include commentary by the creators in writing, video, or audio format. So our example is a virtual school tour. 
A group of sixth grade students in Rebecca Komnanaki's innovations class, which is an elective in Lynchburg, Virginia, had experienced how scary it was to attend a new middle school having never seen it. They hadn't been able to tour the new school in person when they started. So to help future students, they created a virtual tour of the school that people could access online. Their teacher says they had hiccups in the beginning where they figured out which group members preferred to work on the tour, which students preferred to take pictures, and which of their original ideas needed to be reconsidered. But they truly collaborated, and they did so independently. Komnanaki says, I cannot say enough about how little I did and how these students collaborated and worked during class, on weekends, and after school to get pictures of empty halls, all without me ever asking. So here's information on their tech. Although students didn't use a collaboration platform for this project, they used a camera and app from GoPro to capture images of the school. And then they used the website ThingLink to put the tour together and make it accessible to viewers. The finished tour was shared as a VR goggle tour with incoming fifth grade classes in the spring to get students excited about middle school. So if you're going to do a tour type project, how would you add criticality and agency? Rather than aiming for an objective capture of a place, tours can also be created with deliberate subjectivity with a goal in mind. So that goal can be to empower the viewer, such as helping them locate places for assistance, accessible spaces for people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus friendly spaces, or to document a problem, such as virtually traveling the distance required to get to healthy food sources from certain neighborhoods. And I want to thank Colin Seal from our very last episode for sparking this idea, because this is something he brought up in our conversation. So then, once a tour has been created, students can take the next step in sharing it with the people who need to see it for impact. So idea number four is a curated collection. Here, students carefully select items that have something in common and then share them with a defined audience. This might look like a physical or virtual museum exhibit, a top 10 list presented as a video, a list of the most, the best, or the worst of something, or a collection of stories, photos, or artifacts that represent some central idea. And in the post, I've got a link to a blog post from a couple years ago about other curation project ideas. So an example of this is a retrospective video. Students in Marissa Thompson's high school ELA class in California were tasked with creating a year in review video that showcased a selection of key moments in the past year built around a theme chosen by the student. So this started as an individual project, but in 2019, her students decided to work together on creating a decade in review video. The tech for this project, Thompson allowed students to use whatever programs they knew to put their videos together. And this is very characteristic of her style of teaching, and it makes sense. Uh, Marissa Thompson, by the way, is the person who introduced the TQE method of class discussion that we talked about in a previous episode. And her website is called unlimitedteacher.com. So that's just one example of sort of a curation of things. So if you were going to do a project like this, how would you add criticality and agency? Well, because curation requires us to represent larger ideas with a small selection, it does a really good job of telling a story or sharing information in a way that can grab the attention of the viewer. So one approach for using curation with criticality is to have students collect items that will raise others' awareness of marginalized populations. One example of this is the Voice of Witness series of books that tells the stories of people whose voices are rarely heard. And we spoke to Cliff Mayotte, who is in charge of Voice of Witness, um, in episode 105. It's an excellent series of books, of just narratives, of the experiences of lots and lots of uh, different groups of people who hardly ever get to have a voice. The same type of project can be done with other forms of media. Um, Other websites that do this are the Global Oneness Project and the Disability Visibility Project. They are both dedicated to basically telling the stories 
uh, that don't get told as, as often as they should be. So students could do something similar. As they build their own collections, they can also be thinking, and this is the agency piece, about the intended audiences for those collections, how they might get their work in front of them, and what kind of a change they might hope to inspire as a result. And then uh, idea number five, and let's go ahead and review what we have so far. Idea one was a guide. Idea two was a local research project. Three is a tour. Four is a curated collection. And five is a solution. With this one, students work together to develop a solution to a problem. The solution can be a physical product, a digital product, a prototype of some kind, or even an imagined or proposed item, plan, or system that solves a problem. So the example that we have is an app development. So high school students in Jeff Schmidt's software engineering class in Naperville, Illinois, had a whole semester to design their own app. This came after those same students had completed AP Computer Science and an additional semester covering topics like engineering process and technology ethics. So over on the post, I've got a link to a blog post that Schmidt has written about the whole process and how he organized it. And then also there's a link to a website called Mary Tudor, M-E-R-R-Y, which is one of the student created apps that came out of this process. Um, Mary Tudor is a platform that matches volunteer tutors with students who need tutoring in this community. So to work on this project, students use, this is the tech piece, students used both a website called Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O, and Slack, which we mentioned earlier, to manage their projects. Um, but Schmidt said that Trello was the more critical of the two for the work that they did. And he also shared with us an example Trello board for a team that worked on a software project so that you can see sort of how they used it. So. You know, if students are creating some sort of a, a solution as your collaborative project, how could you add criticality and agency? Students can be tasked with solving problems that impact vulnerable populations or that perpetuate inequalities on a small or a large scale. Whether or not their solutions can actually be implemented should not discourage students from brainstorming them. As part of the solution development process, students can interview people who are most impacted by the problem and those in positions to implement solutions. And to add agency, they can also research the pathways taken by ordinary citizens to turn ideas for solutions into reality so that they can get a better idea of how an idea becomes something that actually exists in the world. So those are the five ideas. On top of that, I've got a couple of things just to sort of help you make these collaborative projects work. The first is a link to a 2020 post that uh, I wrote called Making Cooperative Learning Work Better. And this is episode 138, where I gathered some of the most common cooperative learning problems that teachers have when they're doing these types of things and how to, how to, to deal with them effectively. Another resource comes from Marissa Thompson, who shared that uh, retrospective video idea. She's got a separate article that offers tips from students on designing collaborative activities that work. She, she sort of accidentally found herself conducting a, an activity with students that was going really well, and she couldn't quite figure out why. So she asked her students, you know, why are you, <laughs> why are you working so well on this? Is this how it is in all of your other classes? And they said no, and so she said why, and they actually were able to give her feedback on what it was about the way she had designed that particular task that made it go so well, and so she shared those, and so I've got a link to that. And then finally, I've got a link from an organization called PBL Works, which is um, project-based learning. PBL Works, they've got a really good set of collaboration rubrics for different grade levels that outline specific skills and standards for collaboration that can guide you when you're teaching collaborative skills to your students and giving them feedback on how they're doing. So that's what I have for you today. And I'm also asking if after listening to this, if you are thinking, oh, I did one that worked really well too. I would love to have you come over to the site and actually share it 
so that we can, we'll have these five ideas, but then we'll have more in the comments from other teachers who have heard these and said, yeah, and also try this too. So for links to all of the resources that I mentioned in this episode or to come and share your idea, visit cultofpedagogy.com, click podcast and choose episode 195. To get a bi-monthly email from me about my newest blog posts, podcast episodes, courses, and products, sign up for my mailing list at cultofpedagogy.com slash subscribe. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.